consider together one of the most fascinating subjects uh, of the Bible, but perhaps not something that we would obviously think of looking at. When we look at the Bible, we think perhaps there's a, there's a gospel message, there's the Lord Jesus Christ, there's the hope of everlasting life in, in God's kingdom. But yet, the character of God is one of those elements that is so fundamental for us to understand uh, what God's plan and purpose is. So we're going to spend a couple of moments just having a look at how important the character of God is for our understanding of his plan and purpose with each and every one of us. The Bible says God dwells in light and approachable. Now you try to find a graphic that, that burns your eyes out. It's very difficult to find. But that's an element of God's character. So there is something special and truly unique about God uh, that the Bible invites us to consider. So as we go through, we're going to have a look at a revelation of God's nature. We're going to have a look briefly at how did our existence commence. We're going to look at creation and, and explore a little bit about how God created everything that we see around us. Because that's helpful for us as we think about what is the obligation on us uh, in relation to God. Then we want to try to think about how do we understand God? The Bible talks about it's the importance of us if we wish to be uh, followers of him and the Lord Jesus Christ, that we must love him with all our heart, soul, mind, uh, and strength. What does that mean uh, in practice? And we're going to have a little look um, at that. And then finally, we're going to draw our thoughts to a conclusion by thinking about the personal invitation that's been given to each and every one of us for God to truly be our father, to develop that profound relationship with him uh, and be with him and the Lord Jesus Christ in his kingdom uh, forever that shall never uh, come to an end. So there's a, a fabulous and fascinating message of hope uh, that we're going to finish our talk on uh, this morning. So let's have a quick look then at God as creator. Now, if you have your Bibles uh, open, so it's good to turn things up. Some of the, some of the uh, quotes will be on the screen, others will, will turn up. Uh, but just turn to, to, uh, to Genesis chapter 1 uh, and verse 1. Now, we know that the word Genesis means beginnings uh, in the Hebrew. So Genesis 1 verse 1, we have quite a dramatic statement. In the beginning, God created uh, the heavens and the earth. Fascinating opening chapter and verse in this Bible, because it makes a claim that man's existence is not by chance. It wasn't that there was a special being that created certain conditions whereby life may or may not uh, come about over thousands or millions of years. No, there was a specific and deliberate and purposeful uh, creation that God took forward. And it goes on to say, doesn't it, in the Genesis record, that everything that we see, all the organisms, uh, the plants and the animals that we're familiar with, all came from Genesis chapter 1. And that really is, is quite a profound statement because once we appreciate and accept that there is a creator and that we have been created, we're a product of that creation, then it leads us to think, well, what does the creator want from us? Do we have anything that we need to do? What are the obligations uh, that are upon us because of the wonderful gift of life that each and every one of us has been given. So God created the heavens and the earth, showing uh, his omnipotence. He is from everlasting to everlasting. Something that is truly unique about God is that he seems to have been always in existence. It's quite a difficult thing sometimes for the human brain to kind of comprehend. And that us in this time frame, when our mortal lives are so short, aren't they? That there is a being that continues to exist throughout time. But the Bible tries to help us to, to understand a little bit by saying, look, when you look up at the stars and the planets, 
You're getting a glimpse of the glory and wisdom of God. Uh, we read that in Psalm 19 and, and verse 1. And the interesting element about that psalm is, is that it's trying to help us understand that when we look at the vastness of space, we get a glimpse, just a glimpse, of the glory and the power of God. And of course, with, with modern technology these days, we can see fascinating <coughs> nebulas, uh, star clusters, galaxies. It's incredible when we, when we look at how far away these different galaxies are. You're talking about, in cases, billions of light years away. How incredibly small we are. Really, we're quite insignificant in the broad scheme of things. When we look at the, the planets and the solar system and indeed the universe. But there is a focus on us as individuals. Each and every one of us in this room has a personal invitation from the creator to follow him and to be with him forever. And so there is this uh, concept that there is a, a purposeful design and creation that is open to all of us if we wish to take it. Now, then we're going to come on and have a, a, a quick look. Uh, in our Bibles, turn with me to the prophecy of Isaiah. It's in the, after Psalms and Proverbs, uh, we come across eventually Isaiah, and we're going to have a look at chapter 6. We're just going to pick out here, uh, and one of the interesting things that we learn about God. This is uh, in the year of King Uzzah, who was a king of, of Judah, and there's a, a vision uh, that is seen. And let's have a look at, at verse 3. And one cried unto the other, this is one of the seraphims, um, we won't cover what they are this, this morning, but they are interesting beings that, uh, that exist in the Bible. And one of them says uh, in verse 3, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. So the word holy uh, just means separate or set apart. Uh, you may have a Bible that, that, that says Holy Bible on it. And that means it, it's a book. Bible means book. A set apart book. A book that's quite different from other books. But God is holy, holy, holy. And that tries to get across how separate God is from us. There is, a, a if you like, a barrier that exists between us and God. Those who follow uh, God and try to, to be good disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible terms as holy, but only one holy. There is a separation uh, from us, from God. We're going to have a, a quick look at why that is the case uh, in a couple of moments. So this verse emphasizes God's perfect moral purity. He never does anything wrong. He is above those things uh, that we experience in our lives. In Deuteronomy 32, it talks about God being a rock. Now, if we think of a rock, we think of something that's hard, sturdy, stable, very difficult to move. Something that you can build upon. Something that gives you a sure foundation. Well, the Bible uses that analogy to explain that what is God is like. He is something that you can build upon. He's dependable, reliable. It says his ways are perfect and all his ways are just. It's an incredible thing to, to, for us to, to digest that the creator is perfect. He doesn't do anything wrong. That's an incredibly reassuring thing, isn't it, for us that we have a creator that does the right things always, not without, without exception. So we know that what he tells us in his Bible is right and true. Because we know, don't we, that in the world today we have chaos in terms of the moral standing of, of society. We, we don't know what, what is right or wrong. And 
seems to be a common uh, practice in this day and age to have a look at the way that we did things 20, 30, 40, 50, even 100 years ago and think that all that was wrong and that the new generation, we're the ones who've got it right. And no doubt, uh, if the Lord remains away, the next generation after will say those people living in the year 2024 were insane, crazy. What were they thinking? And so the moral compass of man evolves and changes over time as things become unacceptable that were acceptable and things that were unacceptable become acceptable. What the Bible says is that God is not like that. He is stable and firm and his ways are perfect and just. But there is a problem with the creation. And we're not going to go into detail here that in, in too much detail because it's a, it's a subject in his own right. But we know, don't we, that from the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve were given, if you like, that, that incredible experience of living in a garden of plentiful. They had everything in abundance, food, uh, shelter. And yet there was one commandment that they were not to do, and that was to take of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we know that's, that's what they did. And so the concept of sin entered into the world. And sin, in its fundamental term, is disobedience to God's commandment. And that separates us from God. That's why we can't approach God's magnificent light. The Bible says that if we do that, if we saw the glory of God, we would, we would pass away. We, we couldn't cope with it. We couldn't comprehend it. It would kill us. And so there's this separation that's happened because of the sin uh, that man has done. And the Bible makes clear it's, it's the sin of Adam that puts us in the grave. We all inherit uh, mortal uh, flesh and human bodies, so to speak. But it's our sin that keeps us there. But, and we'll come on to look at this as well, is it's the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is holy, holy, that connects us back to God, enables us to be uh, his children. Now, another element of God's character that is important for us to, to be thinking about as we're learning about him is his compassion. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 34, the reading that uh, Joe read to us, because here we have a revealing of God's mercy, mercy and graciousness, and the fact that he is slow to anger, he wants everybody uh, to be saved and to follow him. So verse 6 of Exodus chapter 34, the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. So we have here um, Moses experiencing the characteristics of God. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. It's not a beautiful character. If anybody could say that about us, we would be quite pleased, wouldn't we? That, that, that that's um, the kind of person we know that we would like to be like. And even though we try, um, we often fail. But not so with God. Verse 7, keeping mercy for thousands. Forgiving iniquity transgression and sin so there is this idea isn't there that, that even though God has set down his commandments that that people will break he is keen to forgive if people come back to him and are truly sorry for what they've done and try to do better uh, in their lives this is picked up in Romans uh, and chapter 5 because here we have the apostle Paul explaining uh, to the people of his day, what it is that we need to overcome uh, in our lives. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, it says, For God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, and the Apostle Paul says, I'm no different. I, I'm a sinner like you are, says Paul. Christ died for us. And he goes on to explain in verse 12, wherefore, as by one man, that is Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. 
And so death passed upon all men, for all that have all for that all have sinned. And so he's, he's, he's explaining the work of the Lord Jesus Christ to reconcile uh, God's people to him through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn over the page to Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. We have, for the wages of sin is death. That, if you like, it is the consequence of sin. That's the payment uh, that we get if we continue to sin. But the verse goes on to say the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so this is a gift that is freely given. It's not something that we can earn. We, we tried to, 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 to earn it, but it's freely given to us. And through that, we have this wonderful hope of everlasting life in God's kingdom. One other element that we want to pick up on is God is faithful and true. And we learn from the Bible that he has created uh, a number of covenants or solemn promises uh, with his people. Those people that tried to follow him. Abraham is, is a great example. And back in the book of Genesis again, we read, In you, Abraham, shall all families of the earth be blessed. So there's no exclusivity. There's no, it's going to be focused on one particular people or one particular geographical location. Not any particular social standing. It is all families of the earth will be blessed. And, and the Lord Jesus Christ was able to say that that's the blessing that I was going to come. He says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, said Christ, and saw it uh, and was glad. And so we could be reassured that the promises that God has made to the faithful in the Bible apply equally to us. We're just going to have a pick out one little verse uh, from Galatians that emphasizes this point. You don't need to turn there. Um, I'll read it out to you. But this really emphasizes this wonderful hope that's for all of us. Paul says to the Galatians in Galatians 3 and verse uh, 27, for as many of you has been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So baptism it's critically important, isn't it, for, for salvation. It's a very um, poignant symbol that we are joining the body of Christ. That that symbolic death uh, and resurrection, Mark 16, 16 says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Paul goes on in verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if he be Christ's, then are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And of course, the ultimate promise to, to Abraham was going to be the inheritance of God's kingdom uh, with the capital city in Jerusalem. That's a hope that is open to each and every one of us. The final element, and this is where it, it, it really brings it at a, at a personal level for, for all of us, is God's love. John chapter 3 and verse 16 is, is one of those verses that is, is so well known. And it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whomsoever believeth in him should not perish. You won't die, but have everlasting life. And so the Bible talks about God's love for all of us in giving his son for our sins so that we when the kingdom comes may be elevated so that we can we can have a relationship with God directly we can see uh, his glory and not be fearful of passing away and so the Bible invites us to have uh, this personal relationship uh, with him one of the passages that I think uh, is, is a wonderful passage for us to think about when we're thinking about this subject is uh, in Deuteronomy and chapter, chapter 6. Because Deuteronomy chapter 6 talks about 
uh, what was the obligations that God wanted uh, his people to follow. And they were to teach their children uh, the same message. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. And you've got to teach your children. And you think, okay, so God wants us to, to love him. How do we put that into practice? How do we show our love to God? Well, turn over the page to Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12. It tells us. Deuteronomy 10 and verse 12. And now Israel what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the, the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and to keep his commandments. So that's one of the, the fundamental elements that we show our love for God for trying to keep his commandments. That is what God requires of us. There's a very practical example uh, of this in Jeremiah and chapter 22. This is talking, uh, Jeremiah's talking to a king of Judah. Uh, it was a king that was very self-centered. All he cared about was the accumulation of material wealth. He spent a huge amount of time building uh, his palace. Uh, some of us uh, who went uh, with Lane Whitmayer to Jerusalem actually went into this palace and uh, Spent some time there, not much is left. But this was the message that was given to this king. And the contrast is being drawn between Jehoiakim, this wicked king, and his father Josiah. And we read in verse 15 of Jeremiah 22. Shall you reign because you covered yourself in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink? And do judgment and justice, and then it was well with him. What does that mean, judgment and justice? Well, verse 16, it says he judged the cause of the poor and needy, then it was well with him. Was this not to know me, saith the Lord? It's a profound statement, isn't it? That if we profess to love God, we must try to show forth, to manifest, to, to live his characteristics. We need to put others before ourselves. We need to, to look after those who are in need of help. We don't pass by on the other side. We, we don't say, oh, well, that's someone else's job. No, that's our role and responsibility. And of course, ultimately, we look to the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, who manifested those characteristics of his father perfectly in, in his life. That he followed after his father in all ways, even to the giving of his life for sin. We're going to finish off uh, by having a look at first the first epistle of John and having a look at verse 16 of John chapter 3. So the first epistle of John, it's right at the end of the Bible. Uh, it's chapter 3 and verse 16. Hereby, hereby perceive we the love of Christ. Um, some of you may have the King James Version. It says uh, of God in italics, but most modern translations realize uh, that they've got it wrong and uh, that's not what the original says. So hereby perceive we the love of Christ. We know that to be the case because of what comes after. Because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But the Lord Jesus Christ was discussing with, with people of his day. And they were talking about what are the most important things. Well, Someone said, well, you need to love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And that's what this verse is talking about. That's what true love means, to lay down our lives for the brethren. Verse 17. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother hath need, 
and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? How can we say that we love God if we don't care about each other? Verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And so this is why it's, it's so important for us to, to be thinking about the character of God when we're also contemplating following him through the waters of baptism. Because we are given this wonderful gift of everlasting life in God's kingdom. But it doesn't mean that it's an automatic right. We have to try to develop a relationship with God by trying to show forth his characteristics in our interactions with each other. That's what the Bible says is so uh, important. Chapter 4 crystallizes uh, this sentiment in verse 21. It's perhaps one of the most condensed verses uh, that talks about this subject. Verse 21 of the first epistle of John, chapter 4. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loves God love his brother also. It's beautiful for its simplicity, isn't it? That we need to love each other. And by doing that, we show that we love God. So our conclusion, we've had a look, haven't we, of, of the character of God, that the fact that he's created all things, that he is just and true, completely dependable, keeps his promise. But more importantly for us as individuals, that there's an invitation, that there is a plan and purpose with each and every one of us uh, as individuals that we can come to know him personally through his Bible, through prayer, and through our interactions with each other, that we can develop the relationship with our Heavenly Father, the Lord God of Heaven, by putting others first in our lives. And through doing that, we have a glimpse of his love for us. And so we think, don't we, that as we read God's word together and we, we pray that, that God will continue to guide us through the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can fully understand these great and precious promises that, that we have been given and that we too can, can put on the Lord Jesus Christ through the waters of baptism and be saved. And so may our Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ be with us all as we read from his word and we try to put into practice what we learn and be given that gift of everlasting life in God's kingdom. Thank you so much for listening.